Well, so I'm going to read some poems and talk a little bit about them. Uh, and I want to start with a poem that I have. Uh, it's the first poem in one of my books, and often uh, in the, I brought only seven books, so there's lots of poetry to read. Uh, uh, but I often have a poem that you know, precedes the other poems in my books, which is a kind of direct poem welcoming the reader. Um, in this case, um, I don't, I'm not big on, uh, on epigraphs, but this poem does have an epigraph from Yeats. And um, Yeats had a very exalted idea of the poet. He said at one point that the poet is never the bundle of accident and incoherence that sits down at, to breakfast. <laughs> and the epigraph that I chose for the poem, he says something similar. He says, a poet uh, never speaks directly as to someone at the breakfast table. So Yeats had a very low opinion of the institution of breakfast itself. <laughs> <laughs> important meal of the day. <laughs> so, the, um, so I take issue with him in this poem, and it's called A Portrait of the Reader with a Bowl of Cereal. <laughs> Every morning I sit across from you at the same small table, the sun all over the breakfast things, curve of a blue and white pitcher, a dish of berries, me in a sweatshirt or robe, you invisible. Most days we are suspended over a deep pool of silence, I stare straight through you, or look out the window at the garden, the powerful sky, the cloud passing behind the tree. There is no need to pass the toast, the pot of jam, or pour you a cup of tea, and I can hide behind the paper, rotate in its drum of calamitous news. But some days I may notice a little door swinging open in the morning air, and maybe the tea leaves of some dream will be stuck to the china slope of the hour. Then I will lean forward, elbows on the table, with something to tell you, and you will look up, as always, your spoon dripping milk, ready to listen. <laughs> so that's a rather idealized sense of what the reader might be. Um, this poem is, uh, <clears throat> is based on, uh, well, it started with a, it refers to the title at least, <laughs> I'm backtrack and ready. Uh, uh, it's called The Sandhill Cranes of Nebraska. <laughs> the Sandhill Cranes of Nebraska. Too bad you weren't here six months ago, was a lament I heard on my visit to Nebraska. You could have seen the astonishing spectacle of the Sandhill Cranes, thousands of them feeding and even dancing on the shores of the Platte River. There was no point in pointing out the impossibility of my being there then because I happened to be somewhere else. So I nodded and put on a look of mild disappointment, if only to be part of a commiseration. It was the same look I remember wearing about six months ago in Georgia when I was told that I had just missed the spectacular annual outburst of azaleas, brilliant against the green backdrop of spring. And the same in Vermont, six months before that, <laughs> when I arrived shortly after the magnificent foliage had gloriously peaked, Mother Nature, as she is called, having touched the hills with her many-colored brush. A phenomenon that occurs, like the others, around the same time every year, when I am apparently off in another state, <laughs> stuck in a motel lobby with a local paper and a styrofoam cup of coffee busily missing God knows what. <laughs> I, uh, one of the reasons I wrote that poem, besides that actually happening, was that it was spurred by a, uh, a, a dictionary that was put out a few years back, um, in which, uh, which was uh, composed of uh, words that writers had made up. Um, and uh, the best word in the dictionary, I thought, was made up by uh, a fellow poet, Howard Nemiroff, who was also a consultant in poetry and a wonderful poet. Um, and he came up with the word, uh, the verb to azaleate. <laughs> and to azaleate means to commiserate needlessly with some visitor about a local phenomenon that they just missed. <laughs> <laughs> because they arrived too late, or they will miss because they arrived too early. <laughs> 
know the lovely two-line poem, my favorite two-line poem by Howard Nemiroff, called Bacon and Eggs? The chicken contributes, but the pig gives his all. <laughs> Many poets uh, uh, come to a point where they admire a poem so much or they want to correct a, uh, a poem of someone else's that they write a version of that poem, a direct version. And uh, this is all done uh, out, out front. Um, the protocol that's followed is one uses the same title as the previous poem, and then, as you probably know, underneath that you write the expression after. So after Rilke, after Neruda, whatever. So I wanted to write a, a version of um, a poem by the Chinese poet Li Po, a poem called Drinking Alone. And I wrote the title on a piece of paper, and under it I dutifully wrote after Li Po, and then I got completely tangled up in the expression after Li Po. <laughs> and this is how far the poem got. Uh, Drinking Alone after Li Po. This is not after Li Po, the way the state is after me, for neglecting to pay all my taxes, <laughs> or the way I am after the woman in front of me on the long line of the post office. Li Po, I am not saying after you, as I stand wholly open one of the heavy glass doors that divide the centuries in a long corridor of glass doors. No, the only way this is after you is in the way they say, it's just one thing after another, like the way I will pause to raise a glass of wine to you after I finish writing this poem. So let me get back to sitting in the wind alone among the pines with a pencil in my hand. After all, you had your turn, and mine will soon be done. Then someone else will sit here after me. <laughs> One of, the, uh, one of the obligations of uh, being a poet is to know something about birds and flowers, <laughs> or at least to be able to tell the difference between the birds and the flowers. Um, and I've recently been spending quite a bit of time in Florida where there's a whole set of birds and flowers to get to know. And this poem is about uh, essentially my uh, spot of, uh, of ornithological ignorance. Uh, it's called Adult Osprey. O large, brown, thickly feathered creature with a distinctive white head, you perched on the top branch of a tree near the lake shore. As soon as I guide this boat back to the dock and walk up the grassy path to the house before I unzip my windbreaker and lift the binoculars from around my neck, before I wash the gasoline from my hands, before I tell anyone I'm back, and before I hang the ignition key on its nail or pour myself a drink, I'm thinking of vodka soda with lemon, I will look you up in my illustrated guide to North American birds, and I promise I will learn what you are called. <laughs> Cheerios. One bright morning, in a restaurant in Chicago, as I waited for my eggs and toast, I opened the Tribune, only to discover that I was the same age as Cheerios. <laughs> Indeed, I was a few much older than Cheerios, for today, the newspaper announced, was the 70th birthday of Cheerios, or as mine had occurred earlier in the year. Already I could hear them whispering behind my stooped and threadbare back, why, that dude's older than Cheerios. <laughs> the way they used to say, why, that's as old as the hills. Only the hills are much older than Cheerios. Or any American breakfast cereal. And more noble and enduring of the hills, I surmise, as a bar of sunlight illuminated my orange juice. <laughs>